I'm going to be talking about Helen McGraw, the third of the Irish crystallographers this, in this session. Um, and uh, Helen, the reason I talk about Helen is because I worked for her for several years at the Cavendish Lab in Cambridge and got to know her very well. So this is Helen McGraw, born in 1907, died in uh, 2002 at a great age. And uh, let me see. Does this work? Oh, that one. Okay, so she was born in Dublin, uh, 1907, to a distinguished Northern Irish family. So she wasn't the Southern Irish, really. Her family were Protestant, uh, uh, with distinguished Protestant figures in, Northern, in Ireland. Her father had been Lord Chief Justice of All Ireland at one stage and very much involved in, uh, in politics. Uh, she had a brother who became uh, Lord Chief Justice McGaw of the Court of Appeal, uh, several other uh, distinguished members of the family. She went to Cambridge as a scholar at Burton College, which uh, at that time was an all-female college, uh, and eventually she obtained the MA in Cambridge in 1932. And then she did her PhD in Cambridge in 1934, working uh, in Bernal's group. So, he worked with Bernal during a PhD, and a thesis title was The Thermal Expansion of Crystals and the Structure Hydrogelite, which is a kind of aluminium hydroxide uh, compound. That was her thesis. She was a contemporary with Dorothy Hodgkin, and they worked together. Uh, and in fact, I have it back in Oxford, I have a crystal model that she made of hydrogelite together with, with Dorothy Hodgkin. Uh, the picture on the left is Helen McGaw with a camera, an X-ray camera, which is the commercial version at the time of Bernal's uh, oscillation rotation camera that uh, John Finney showed you before. And uh, the, uh, one of the things she did was to work on ice. He, actually uh, discovered that one way of working with ice was to encapsulate water into a, a glass tube, cool it down with a, uh, a dewer and a, 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 a copper wire attached to the, to the cold end. Uh, she could cool it down and several times and grow crystals of ice. And then she could take the x-ray pictures on that sort of camera that we have in the picture. And she could actually uh, work out the unit cell dimensions of ice and she did this for ice and also for the deuterated version. Uh, now this uh, idea of encapsulating uh, crystals in a tube, she actually uh, suggested to Bernal that you should use that for proteins. Proteins needed to be uh, looked at in an aqueous solution. So she, she, she first suggested that. She worked on the structure of ice which uh, an island in Antarctica was named after her. Her first paper here in Nature in 1934 is on the cell dimensions of ordinary and heavy ice. So this is the first time that it had been possible to measure the cell dimensions of the, of, of the crystal of ice. But that's not bad for a, a first paper in Nature. The island, well, here is Antarctica, and if we look just there, there's a whole range of interesting islands there that have been named after scientists. And this is a, what you get. So you'll notice uh, Bragg Islands, uh, Pauling Islands, Bernal Islands there, and down at the bottom left there is Magor Islands. Very difficult to find actually on the modern map, but uh, apparently they're still there. So working in Bernal's group, this is a photograph taken, I think, at the Royal Institution uh, in 1946. And uh, there's Bernal in the middle and uh, Helen McGaw next to, uh, next to Bernal. In 1934-1935, she moved to Vienna from Austria and she worked with Hermann Mark at the Chemistry Institute. He then came to Oxford, 
looked at Professor Simon at the Clarendon Laboratory, measuring the density and compressibility of solid hydrogen in deuterium. So she's already working on a number of different ideas. In 1937, she uh, had no job in, in, in the universities, so she taught at Bedford High School for Girls and at Bradford Grammar School for Girls. And during this time, she started working on diamonds and their use for wire drawing dyes. In '43, she was employed as an X ray crystallographer at the Phillips Mitchum Works Research Laboratory. And there she did the first structure of an important perovskite, a ferroelectric material, barium titanate, which was published in Nature in 1945. Now, this uh, structure is a very important structure, and today, is very, very fashionable. Thousands and thousands of papers are being published as we sit here on perovskites. It's, it's taken off. But she was one of the first. So when she worked on perovskites, there were probably only about half a dozen papers on perovskites published per year. Now it's hundreds of thousands. So she was very much there in the early days. Now on the left, we have barium titanate. At its high temperature phase, it's cubic. And the things to note are the green. Uh, balls, those are the barium atoms. The red ones are oxygens, and, it, and the oxygens form these octahedra drawn in blue. And at the center of the octahedra, the little blue atom there, that's titanium. And when you cool it to below 120 Celsius, it becomes slightly distorted, it becomes what we call a tetragonal phase. And if you look very carefully, you can see that the titanium atoms and now have moved off center in the vertical direction. And that makes this material electrically polar. And it's because of that, it's, it's very important. It is today still used in capacitors as a, as a dielectric material, a very good dielectric. And this particular arrangement of octahedra, oxygens, and, and, and cations, and so on, is the archetypal arrangement for perovskite. And it's the basis of thousands and thousands of other perovskite type compounds which are being studied today with interesting properties. Now, Helen had a very special gift. She could, she didn't use computers, but she could use her brain. And she could visualize crystal structures up here in her brain. And she could turn them around in her brain. And if you went to her and say, what does the structure of, I don't know, quartz, what does it look like down a particular direction, she would think about it for a few moments, take a piece of paper out and a pen, and she'd sketch it. It's a very, very unique gift. I can't do that. I don't suppose anybody here could do that. We, we now resort to computers to do it. So she was very interested in taking crystal structures and dissecting them and looking at the particular features of interest. So on the left is a model. So uh, she was very keen on making models of, of various things. And what you see here, these red things, those are octahedra, and they're joined at their corners in a particular way. And the question she was trying to answer was, if I take an octahedron and I tilt it, I twist it a bit, what happens to the others? And so she was trying to approach that from a model. On the right-hand side is another model that she made. I think I've got it here. Here it is, made out of perspex. And uh, what you're looking at here are octahedra. These things are sketched out there. And if you rotate them, they eventually become close packing. So it's able to show a relationship between that original perovskite structure with ordinary close packing of atoms, just by twisting these octahedra and using this, this model. Mm -hmm. Ferroelectricity, a very important uh, property of materials, was discovered in 1920 by Velasic on uh, um, Rochelle's salt. Uh, this is the first book published on ferroelectricity, which Helen did. And in there, a lot of crystal structures are shown there, but also a lot of the properties of ferroelectrics are described. So that was 1957. 1945, she went to Birkbeck, the inorganic section of the crystallography laboratory 
working on Portland cement and concrete. 46, she was elected to, the, uh, to Girton College as a fellowship and a director of studies and lecturer in physics. That year also, she joined the crystallography laboratory at the Cavendish and uh, uh, was an assistant researcher under W.H. Taylor, Will Taylor. Will Taylor had been a student of W.L. Bragg, and when uh, Bragg became Cavendish professor, it was W.H. Taylor who ran the crystallography laboratory for him. 49, she became assistant director of research and then lecturer in physics in 1959. So this is just one of many uh, photographs I have showing some of the group at the uh, Cavendish Laboratory in the Austin wing. And uh, you can see Helen McGaw second from left in the bottom row. Next to her is W.H. Taylor and then Jane Brown and Abe Yoffe on the right. Uh, and there's some students at, at the back. What else does she do? Well, she was interested not only in just structures, but also in their disorder, what happens when you don't have perfect crystals. Uh, and she was involved in working on this, what's called the theory of stacking faults, and what happens as you progress through a crystal and you, you introduce faults in the structure. She worked on the notation for felspars. Now, felspars, very important mineral. It's the most common mineral on Earth and also the surface on the moon. Very complicated set of structures, uh, low symmetry, some of them. Took a lot of work to, to understand those structures. And in fact, one of the things she discovered in felspars was a thing she called the crankshaft, which was a set of uh, tetrahedra joined together to form a shape like a crankshaft. And this was essentially useful for understanding the mechanical behavior of felspars. He worked on phase transitions again back in Perovskite, and uh, when I uh, met her in 1969 uh, to work for her, she was working on sodium nibate, NaNbO3, uh, and this was the area that she put me on to work on the phase transitions. Again, in felspars, what happens when you take tetrahedra and you tilt them? What happens to those? How, what sort of structures can you make? He produced first crystallographic book list for the International Union in 1965. And then she wrote a, a really excellent book, if you have a chance to get it, Crystal Structures, A Working Approach, 1973. So when I joined uh, the department then, she had done some work with Sikorsky, Kali, Lukashevich, and published a paper on the phase transitions in sodium nibate. And you see it's really very complicated set of phases here. A lot of this was guesswork. So my job was to invent a proper high temperature camera so we could actually get, actually I decide whether, how much of this is true. And so I did that and produced this diagram, which is now the correct diagram for the complicated phases of this material. But you can see it's really the same. And Helen had been able to work out simply by, with a lot of guesswork involved in there. That's how clever she was. Another thing that she, she did was in the 1940s, 1946, she had the idea that crystallographic structures, the, the drawings that we make of them, are really very really nice pieces of art. And so she persuaded the Directive Design Council to think about creating fashionable designs based on uh, crystallographic crystallography. And this came to fruition in 1951 with the Festival of Britain, and her designs, well, she became a consultant to the uh, Festival Pattern Group, who produced all of the designs for the Festival of Britain. So, for example, booklets, now you see that ties, this is, a, this is one of the ties from the 51 exhibition. Uh, the the uh, restaurant there, the regatta restaurant, and you see there's some curtains over there, at the back of the table. Well, here it is. It's an offcut of that material there. Very, very expensive to make. Uh, and it's now in the uh, Victorian Albert. So cups and saucers were engraved with crystallography designs. The waitresses carried um, uh, uh, collars, 
crystallographic designs and so on. Everywhere was crystallography. It was the scientific discipline of 1951. This book came out uh, several, many, a few years ago by Leslie Jackson. I have a copy here, and I'll leave it there for anybody to have a look at. But uh, if you're interested in all of this, what Helen McGore did towards the, fe the uh, Festival of Britain and so on, it's a very, very good read, and I recommend it to you. So From Atoms to Patterns by Leslie Jackson. Very good book. In terms of honours, he received an honorary doctor of science in 1967. I think, despite her greatness, I think she was overlooked by the establishment to some extent. She was never made professor. I don't think she quite fitted in the, in the Cavendish Laboratory, which was a physics department, and she's very much a mineralogist. So I think there was a, a, a problem there. He was the fellow of the Mineralogical Society of America, fellow of the Institute of Physics, and she received the Roebling Medal of the Mineralogical Society, uh, the first woman to receive it in 1989. And eventually she obtained an honorary degree at Queen's College, Belfast. This is something that she said, I'll read it to you. Throughout these years, Though I had had to leave barium titanate behind me in Mitcham, I was still thinking about ferroelectric and following the literature. I never did like Rochelle Salt, the surrogate messy, but uh, KH2PO4 uh, was very pretty with interesting hydrogen bonds. She saw everything through structures. And at a conference in London organized by Uberloader, I suddenly realized that I just couldn't accept the way other people were thinking about phase transition and twinning in terms of thermodynamics and free energy. Back in Cambridge, I knew that my picture was much more in terms of structure with specific changes of atomic positions or linkage. As this line of thought developed, I found myself at odds, not only with chemists, but with physicists who wanted to explain everything in terms of particular electrical or electromechanical coefficients. But I had hard work learning enough crystal physics to be able to get my meaning across. So she was very much a structural person. And here she obtained the uh, honorary degree at the uh, University of Belfast in 2000. So that is Helen McGaw, and uh, she, she lived to, to 90, uh, 93. Uh, a great age, uh, and she died in uh, Ballycastle in Northern Ireland. So, if you have any questions, I'll take them. <laughs> Elspeth. Elspeth, you'll have to shout because I'm hard of hearing. Did you get arrested for cutting a bit off that curtain? Oh. Did you what? <laughs> Did you get arrested for cutting a bit off the curtain? What this? Uh, yeah. Well, now this this actually this is a remake of the original material that uh, we did at the British Crystallographic Association many years ago, and a number of us have got large pieces of this material for curtains and uh, tablecloths and so on. What? Wine. Who's got the wine list? <laughs> Yes. Could I just ask something about a tell a story? It's not so much a question, but a story. But at the Science Museum, we got wind of the fact that there was, I think it was in, I'm not sure if it was in a bathroom or it was a, 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 a partition in a sitting room, but um, Helen McGall in a flat in Cambridge had a very rare example of Festival of Britain frosted mm. glass. Yes. And we tried very hard to get it, but we, we, we never got it in the end. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, the Festival of Britain pattern material is now becoming scarcer and scarcer, so it's um, quite yeah. a pity. Are there any more questions? Well, the, the, festi the Festival of Britain patterns, it disappeared for several years, and then were found much later, and there was an exhibition at the Wellcome Trust a few years ago, showing all of these things and, uh, as, as exhibits. Most of the stuff is now in the, in the V&A. I believe there was a frosted glass pattern, I'm not quite sure what the... 
crystal circle one was remains it was lots of little dots basically mm. that remained popular for many yes. years afterwards. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, you, you commented that um, you think she was unjustly overlooked, Miss Petra. You're going to have her to start, yeah. And you, you said you commented on the fact that she seems to have been overlooked a lot in terms of what, what work she did. But perhaps it's worth pointing out that Bernal obviously had considerable confidence in her abilities by the fact that she appointed her, as you say, in '46 to run the concrete and cement work for. For his, for his new laboratory. So obviously he thought she had great potential and had obviously established herself before then. I mean, it's interesting also that um, Bernal, as you know, was a, a well-known communist and, and uh, Dorothy Hodgkin was uh, left-leaning, left quite the antithesis of Helen McGaw, who was strong Protestant, rather right-wing. Uh, she and I disagreed politically quite often, had many interesting discussions. Uh, but on the other hand, we liked each other very much. Ian. Thank you. Um, just to comment on perovskites, uh, you mentioned feldspars, which are extremely abundant in crustal minerals, but in fact the bulk of the earth is made of magnesium silicate perovskite yes. because the whole of the lower mantle, it's the major phase in the whole That's of right. the lower mantle. Yeah. Uh, you don't see it because you need a quarter of a million atmospheres to keep it stable. It drops to bits. If you Bring it back to the surface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Magnesium silicate with the perovskite, of course, is in the mantle. And that's the major component of the lower mantle and the of the earth. Um, and uh, this idea of tilting the octahedra and so on plays a very important part in in understanding those materials. Anything else? I'm not a scientist, oh, out yeah, of the I'm sort of, here. out of the kind of ranking of things that she didn't, but she spent five years of the war as a teacher. She didn't become a lecturer until she was um, 1970, uh, uh, until she was 50, over 50. Um, I mean, why was she out? It couldn't have been because she was, just because she was right wing or, or anything. No. Well, she, she had trouble getting, getting employment. She moved around quite a lot part of the problem, um, and she ended up in a physics department, which at times could be a bit hostile to somebody in working in crystallography. I remember it very well. Uh, when I was at the Cavendish lab, I had a battle on my hands to keep the group going. Yeah. I think it's time for lunch. Thank okay. you very much.